Just trying to do a story, get in the field, how people react. Cool, man. Cool. Hey, what's, what's your badge number? What is your badge number, sir? Get thing out of my face. Don't, don't, don't touch my, face. my camera, dude. Get don't touch my, my camera. What's your badge number? Get that out of my face. Cameras! 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 Grabs the camera, kind of lowers it down, and says, hey, don't film me. You know, you're not allowed to film me. I'm undercover. Now the story that might never have surfaced if someone hadn't picked up his home video camera. We've all seen the pictures of Los Angeles police officers beating a man they had just pulled over. The city's police chief said today he will support criminal charges against some of the men. Here's ABC's Gary Shepard. The three police officers facing felony criminal charges were among a group of 15 who stopped a 25-year-old black man last Saturday night, then beat him, kicked him, and clubbed him, unaware that an amateur photographer was recording the incident on videotape. If George Holliday, a 31-year-old plumbing contractor living in Lakeview Terrace, Los Angeles, had not taken his camera outside to capture this footage, the beating of Rodney King, one of the most remembered human rights atrocities of the 20th century may have gone completely unnoticed except by King himself and the men who brutally and repeatedly beat him as he lay defenseless on the ground. As an animal rights activist, I can't even begin to estimate how many hours of footage I've captured of people in public. People working, shopping, or just doing whatever it is people do while in plain sight outside. I've also been approached by pedestrians, police officers, and security guards telling me that I'm not allowed to take pictures here or take pictures of them or their faces or that I can't take pictures of businesses or buildings. And it used to be that I had no idea whether they were right, wrong, or whether they really had any clue themselves. I didn't know whether I was allowed to take their picture. I didn't know whether I was allowed to share it on Facebook or on YouTube. In this film, I'm going to explore the challenges activists encounter when using their cameras in public and get to the bottom of what we can and cannot do under the law. In 1991, Kodak released the first digital consumer camera back. You could attach your film camera to the digital back, which allowed you to leave the film out of your camera and capture your images digitally instead. In the year 2000, the first consumer camera phone, the JSH04, hit the market in Japan. But today with their photo resolution sensors and internet connectivity, smartphones have enabled regular people like you and me to become citizen journalists. And thanks to blogs and photo and video sharing sites, we even have our own easily accessible publishing options, some of which allow us to publish in real time as the events are happening. This is called a Teradec, and it sort of translates uh, the images that you take off your video to translate it to uh, film for the internet. We attach this mechanism to our camera and we, uh, we shoot and it's live. So that allows you just to, to stream as it's happening right onto the internet? Yeah, I think it's fabulous. Unfortunately, with the incredible potential and power of digital image capture and digital sharing, there's also been a backlash. Photography specifically and videography are, are under attack in our world right now. You can be photographing kids in a playground uh, for a newspaper feature or something and have a parent get angry with you because they don't understand why you're taking pictures of their kids because there's a lot of hysteria surrounding photography now. You could be photographing a building that's considered like a strategic point of interest for a potential terrorist and this is in the words of the government of Canada or I've also encountered this in the UK where you could be photographing one of these buildings and then be interrogated by security, possibly even detained by police, despite the fact that you haven't broken any laws whatsoever. Sometimes you're dealing with situations where people are 
doing something really bad. And they don't want you to see it because they know they're doing something bad. And they think, well, police might confiscate this image of me and it might lead to me getting arrested. I think social media and the internet have opened a lot of people's eyes to the, to the power of imagery. And with that has come a lot of potential and a lot of excitement, but it's also brought a lot of fear. In June of 2010, Ian was on assignment at the G20 summits in downtown Toronto. The heavy-handed actions by police against law-abiding citizens, and particularly journalists, was so unexpected that to this day, he is very much concerned about the suppression of freedoms that took place on our streets. I said, well, we didn't use our bullets. We were just shooting blanks to scare them. And then my photo ran of the, of the riot cop pointing the gun at the crowd, and you can actually see this little bullet leaving the muzzle of the gun. That photo ran in the newspaper, and then the next day they said, well, yeah, we did use rubber bullets. The situation that I was trying to photograph was the kettling at Spadina and Queen Street, which was one of the major sore spots that people held on to after the G20 summits. It was, it was pretty bad. They, they surrounded, I don't know, 100 or 150 people in that intersection in the rain, boxed them in with riot police, and then just kept making the square smaller and pulling people out and assaulting them and arresting them and stuffing them into buses and they were cold and they didn't know what was going on. And I mean, these were just regular people. A lot of them weren't even protesting. And even if they were protesting, it doesn't matter. It's not illegal to protest. Just like it's not illegal to take pictures of it. I was there, I was, I was there. I watched that group of people form. I listened to their message of protest, what they were there to say. I watched exactly what they did. It was completely peaceful, it was completely legal. Nobody was destroying property. Nobody was even being abusive verbally. Everybody was standing there holding signs, saying a message. They were sitting cross-legged on the street and playing guitar. And then they were shot with rubber bullets. One officer told me to walk in a certain direction down a certain street to leave. And so I did that. And then a van full of other police officers pulled up and one of them jumps out and says, uh, show us your credentials or your media pass or whatever. And uh, before I could even say, well, I don't have one, I'm a freelancer, they just started screaming at me, get on the ground and this and that. And I started to just sort of put my hands up and get towards the ground and then they just ran up to me and grabbed me and threw me down and stood on me and went through all my stuff and wrecked my camera gear and I don't know, I was probably on the ground for five minutes, ten minutes maybe and then they just sort of picked me up and said, well, get out of here and I was I was sort of dumbfounded, like they just destroyed my camera, they just like assaulted me, and there's no there's no recourse to that, and you know I'm just doing my job. But it isn't only the state that will violate our rights if we allow it. Corporations have also been mobilizing against public interest. In his book, Green is the New Red, an insider's account of a social movement under siege, Will Potter explores how industry has been trying to erode democracy and how activists for animals and the environment are their prime targets. So my book could talk about the animal rights and environmental movements, which have been labeled as the number one domestic terrorism threat by the FBI. And for a long time, that rhetoric was mainly focused on people who are actually 
breaking the law through civil disobedience or through uh, illegal acts of property destruction. But now it's being used against people who are doing undercover investigations, who are protesting and engaged in lawful activity as well. And so that's when I say these movements are under siege. They're being attacked by some of the most powerful industries in the world. I went out with a group of people uh, leafleting, passing out uh, handbills in a residential neighborhood against animal testing. I mean, I had a background in activism in college, and I really thought this was the most I could do as a working journalist would be something so benign as handing out these flyers. And of course, considering I have like the worst luck of anyone, I, we were all arrested. And you know, I'm just like, this. My, I've never, never been arrested before, never had any trouble. Um, but the important part of that is a couple of weeks later, these two FBI agents came to my door and they said that unless I help them by being an informant and infiltrating protest groups, they would put me on a domestic terrorist list, especially on the left and academic circles. We've talked about state repression, the idea of governments that go too far in uh, squelching dissent and overstepping people's rights. But I think what's going on right now is a shift to a corporate repression. And so really the the driving factors behind all of this are corporations. They've created this rhetoric. They're lobbying for this new legislation. I think the most difficult part of the book that I worked on was trying to define terrorism because I quickly found out that there is no agreed upon definition either within the United States federal law enforcement like the FBI, within the CIA, within states, between countries, the United Nations doesn't have an agreed upon definition. And you quickly realize that that's because the primary function of the term is to remain fluid. It's to be able to uh, be malleable and, and apply to whatever the enemy of the hour is in whatever circumstances. So even with that being said, I think most reasonable people have a general kind of framework of what comes to mind when you hear that word. And I think in the United States and really around the world, you can't mention it without thinking about 9-11, without thinking of physical violence, not just violence, but violence without boundaries and violence against innocent people, against civilians, against children. We've seen nothing like that in these movements. Okay, but how exactly are industries coming down on citizens? What exactly are they doing to citizens or activists? Ag-gag laws are attempts by uh, the agriculture industry to create new legislation that criminalizes undercover investigators. These are people who have documented uh, extreme animal cruelty on factory farms, slaughterhouses, vivisection laboratories. And the industry, rather than reform its practices, is trying to make it illegal to show the public what's really going on. Taylor Raddick, an investigator with compassion over killing, she exposed horrific abuse against calves at a cattle company. The sheriff called her in and said, hey, did you film this? And she said, yes, she had her attorney present. And, then, and he asked some questions about what she saw, the people committing the abuse. They were told that criminal charges were gonna be pressed against those responsible. Uh, and after she acknowledged doing the filming, they took her mugshot on the spot and said she was being prosecuted for animal cruelty herself. This is a young woman who's dedicated her life to protecting animals, to trying to stop uh, this egregious cruelty, and to turn around and charge her with cruelty herself is just really despicable. You know, in some ways I got involved in this issue because I do care deeply about animal protection and environmental issues, but what really has motivated me to focus my life on these topics is that I think it rep represents um, really the, the confluence of so many issues we're dealing with culturally right now and so many threats that we're all facing. It's not just talking about animal protection and environmental issues, which are so incredibly important, but it's looking at how our own civil liberties are being rolled back in the name of protecting corporate profits and protecting people in power. It's about all of us. I mean, these attempts are really intended to make us afraid, to keep us in the dark, and to really undermine our ability to participate in a democracy. Now, fortunately, here in Canada, companies haven't been so bold as to lobby for anti-whistleblower laws, but the paranoia surrounding cameras is indeed very much alive. The first question you always get is, what, do you work for Greenpeace? And it's like, what if I do work for Greenpeace? You know, it's like, it's such a simplistic view of the whole situation. And it's just this culture of fear that's been built around the media. 
uh, and ingrained by their employers, you know, like they're, they're taught that media is bad, you know, like, but why is media bad? Media is only bad if you have something to hide, right? If you're not telling the truth. I'm interested in Fort McMurray and everything it represents in our society. You can only really see two sites, two of the, like, the 30 sites from, from a public highway. And that's Syncrude and Suncor, who are the two biggest players. Anywhere on that highway, you're not allowed to pull over. You're not allowed to stop. If you stop and pull over, there's a security guard on you within 30 seconds. Just to get into those camps, you need a security pass. You need to have this and that. And I understand security, but that environment um, leaks out into the rest of daily life within the community and within the area. So it's simple, you know, oil, good. <laughs> Anyone that doesn't like oil, bad, you know. Photographer probably works for Greenpeace, bad. What are you protecting here? You know what I mean? Like, what are you guarding? What, I'm trying to take a photo. You don't even know who I am. The moment you have a camera, you're the enemy. It's like, I'm not, what am I gonna do here? I'm taking photos, you know? Like, what are you hiding? You know, why won't you talk to me? Like, why am I, you know? Like, why are you denying access from legitimate publications that are trying to get assignments for me to go inside these sites and why won't the PR person reply to me and why do the workers at the bar you know like think I'm public enemy number one they have obviously people are just hyper paranoid about what what an image can do and Facebook and the internet and a photo will last forever but it's like what what harm is really it going to do you know like unless you're doing something wrong if you're doing something wrong, then, like, I'm going to take a photo, <laughs> right? If I think it's wrong. Well, it's clear that some people get paranoid when they see a camera. But what are some of the legal implications of using your photos online, or even downloading someone else's photos and using those? Let's say I wanted to go to an anti-fur demo, and I wanted to make a sign. Does that mean I can just print something I find online and put it on my poster and wave it around in public? Um, I would think that one of the main reasons why that would be okay to make that use is that you would fall under the new exception for user-generated content, it's usually called. Um, at first, some people were calling this exception the YouTube exception, but it is framed more broadly than that. The, the kind of pressure behind it, maybe, was people saying to... Uh, the government. Uh, we don't think that if we make a video of our baby dancing to some pop music, we should be liable for copyright infringement because we use this music without permission. We're not making any money off it. Um, it's just sort of ordinary recreational use that digital technologies allow us to do, right? So there's a new exception in the Act now that for non-commercial purposes, you may use copyrighted materials um, as long as they don't uh, affect the market or the potential market of those materials. It can be used by activists too, right? I mean, activism is non-commercial. Any human expression can be copyrighted as long as it's somehow fixed. And of course, that term fixed means something a little different maybe in the digital age than it used to. So it certainly includes written down or drawn or videotaped or even turned into computer code. It has to be somehow uh, recorded, I guess you could say. So just talking is not copyrightable. But as soon as the talking has been written down or recorded, then it becomes a work that can be covered by copyright. The copyright is usually described as kind of a bundle of rights. So if you um, draw a picture, uh, you have the right to, to publish that picture. Uh, you have the right to uh, convert it into other forms. Um, you have the right to uh, license its use, basically, to other people. In Canadian law, there are eight purposes for which fair dealing can be performed. And let me see if I can list them all. Um, there's criticism and review. There's research and private study. There's news reporting. There's education. And there is satire and parody. So. Uh, if you're doing any of those things, then fair dealing gives you a certain window to reproduce some portions uh, in some circumstances of other people's work without asking their permission. 
if uh, an animal rights organization wanted to make a whole bunch of flyers or use this on their website or something like that, um, I think it would be important for them to just find a photograph that they could clear the rights to. So either a Creative Commons one that already allowed it to be used without permission or paying the photographer. Because I think one of the things that people forget is that it's, it's often not that expensive. You know, you can contact a photographer on Flickr, say, you find their seal photograph, you contact them, you say, hey, could we use this? And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they want a couple hundred bucks for it, you know. And if you're doing a whole campaign, it's not a big deal. So for me, I see these users' rights things as not just a legal issue, but an ethical issue. So you think, well, how much use am I getting out of this photograph? If it's just a one-time thing, you're putting it up on your placard for one day, you're doing that, and it's a kind of a spontaneous thing, that ethically seems really okay. If, however, you're building a whole campaign on it, um, it seems to me that it might be considered to be one of the costs of the campaign that you pay the photographer. Okay, so let's say, for example... Just purely hypothetically, there were a company that were doing things that were perfectly legal, but that in my opinion are extremely cruel. Can I put that on my poster? If you were, for your sign, using a trademark of some kind, like let's say there was a company that was involved in animal cruelty and you wanted to use their logo to dramatize that, uh, you'd have to think about both copyright issues and co uh, and trademark issues. So on copyright grounds, uh, as I said, I think you'd be fine on the user-generated content exception. On the trademark uh, end, uh, the main thing is not to make it look like the company is endorsing your point of view, um, because that would that would infringe their trademark. Uh, only they are allowed to use their trademark to promote their products. Creative Commons is uh, a license that allows uh, creators to waive some of the rights they would otherwise automatically get with copyright. So you might decide that you're fine with people using your work without permission as long as they don't make money off it. And in this case you can sign up online, you just go to creativecommons.org I think it is, and uh, you can go and sign up for um, a non-commercial Creative Commons license and what that means is that people will use your seal photograph wherever they want uh, but if they want to make money off it, then they have to contact you and negotiate a price. Or you might decide that you're fine if people use your work without permission as long as they don't change it, in which case you can get a uh, no derivatives license that makes that clear for people. So it can be quite useful for, uh, for, for creators because they might not always need to retain all those rights. And it certainly can be useful for activists and so on. So if you go... Um, to the Creative Commons site, you can find whole libraries of photographs, for example, and other materials that are available to be used without permission. Um, and that simplifies everything. You don't even need at that point to worry about fair dealing or other exceptions in the law. It's already been cleared for you. And what do we need to know when we're out and about taking photos in public? What are our legal rights regarding photographing people or places? With a camera in public, you can photograph anything that you can see. Anywhere that you're standing on public property, and if you can see something, you can photograph it. Anything you want, including the, uh, the actions of the police. I don't know what you guys are feeding the animals, okay? So I'm going to have to call Health Canada and Agriculture to find out what the regulations are in relation to... Uh, feeding the animals prior to them being slaughtered and stuff. They, they do not have the right to confiscate my equipment. If I haven't broken any laws, if I'm standing on a public street and I make this photograph, no, they do not have the right to confiscate my equipment. If I commit a crime, then theoretically they could confiscate my equipment. We have the right to uh, freedom of assembly. So any time that you're not breaking the law and you're assembling peacefully and it hasn't been deemed an illegal assembly, you're allowed to take part in that. You're allowed to, to observe it and you're allowed to photograph it. Anything on the street, whether it's a Blackberry, an iPhone, or a professional camera, or a video camera, um, or, or, or a camera above a, an ATM, or, or a drone, you know, or any sort of security surveillance, 
you can legally do that on uh, any public property or any property that you own. Or from a public place as well. For example, if you're standing on a public sidewalk against a fence, and the fence is the border between public and private property, but on the other side of the fence you can see something that needs to be photographed, you can photograph it because there's no reasonable expectation of privacy there. Unless it's a crime scene or I'm told by a police officer not to enter this, like as any other member of the public, yes, I can photograph anything I want in public. And does that apply to a citizen as well? Yes. You can't photograph a person in a situation where they could reasonably expect privacy. So, for example, I can't use a telephoto lens to take a picture of somebody changing their clothes in their bedroom or whatever through their window. That's illegal. And I would never do that. And I think most people with common sense would never do that either. But as a member of the public, standing on a public street, you have the right to photograph anything you can see. When it's a member of the public who isn't aware of their rights, the person is often intimidated into um, giving their ID, answering questions, showing their photographs, possibly even deleting photographs, when really they didn't have to do any of that. They could have just walked away. Be educated about it, and when someone says, hey, delete my photo, say, no, I don't need to delete your photo. Like, I've never deleted a photo once for anyone. The photographer owns the photograph and owns the copyright in the photograph. Um, and it's, uh, again, a, a courtesy to those that you're taking the picture of that you get their names or you know, consult them, but you, you own it and can do whatever you can do with any other copyright once you've taken it. Legally speaking, I would make sure that they know that if they're standing in a public place on a public street, they have a right to photograph anything they want. In Canada, there's ex an explicit uh, exception in the law that allows the photography of public buildings and public art without permission. So that's sometimes uh, a relevant matter if you happen to be, say, photographing or filming a, a protest or something like that. Um, that's all fair game. You don't need permission of either the owner or the architect. The only time you would need permission is if you're going on to private property to make the photograph. But if you're standing on the street, uh, anything you can see is okay. Um, you may have logos in there, but it's also worth noting that there's a specific exception in the Canadian Copyright Act for incidental inclusion of copyrighted material. So if you're panning down the street and there's a McDonald's sign and there's whatever all there is, that's okay because that's part of the world and what you're really there to, to film is something else. You've accidentally captured those logos. You don't have to worry about it. First of all, if a member of the public is going to a protest with the intent of creating photographs of what happens and then sharing it through social media, they are a citizen journalist. Professional photographers are really afraid that citizen journalism is going to end journalism. Well, I think it's just going to advance it and make it even more rich. I'm not afraid of someone with an iPhone when I'm photographing beside him. Like I hope I will get a, I should as a professional photographer get a better picture than an amateur with a cell phone. But when there's no professional photographers there, yes, the, their voice is going to go like, far. The media outlets will reuse their images. Like citizen journalism is, is like a very important emerging trend in today's world. Um, it played a huge role during the Arab Spring, and it continues to play a large role in, in various conflicts around the world. As a citizen journalist, you do have uh, a certain advantage over a regular journalist in the sense that you probably won't look like a journalist. Most citizen journalists take pictures with their cell phones or they use smaller uh, domestic type cameras that don't draw as much attention than uh, a photojournalist carrying large camera gear and a big camera bag <clears throat> might garner. So it's, it's nice to uh, it's nice to sort of use that to your advantage if you want to get photographs in a protest. If they're going there with some kind of artistic intention or something else, or they want to create propaganda or whatever, well, that's their prerogative. Fine, whatever. But I would try to talk to them a little bit about the importance of telling the truth and realizing that, yes, you can be a journalist, even if you're a regular citizen.
You, you could see at the G20, the, the majority of those uh, hard-hitting photos and or videos that we see on YouTube and some of the ones that are involved in police forces are from, police cases are from uh, citizens. You know, just from a simple cell phone. Well, there you have it, folks. You're allowed to carry your camera anywhere in public. You're allowed to take photos anywhere in public. And if there's someone doing something that you think they shouldn't be doing, grab your camera and give them hell. to change itself. 